Marvin Sanguinetti here. I am in the car and I thought I would just do a very quick video uh, on Arianism and Unitarianism. If you do hear any noise in the background, it's because as you know, I'm on the road and also you can see my staring, the staring from my car. It is kind of obstructing the video somewhat. So what exactly is Arianism? Uh, Arius has been a very misunderstood uh, figure in the history of the church, actually, particularly known for his popular uh, statement in quotation, there was a time when the sun was not. It has been misconstrued over uh, the period of history that this is a statement with direct reference to those who believe that there was a time when the sun did not exist. But this is not actually what Arius meant. Uh, the presbyter and uh, priest even, um, who was a major opponent of um, Athanasius at the time pre-Nicaea, that is pre-325 CE of the Common Era. Arius actually taught in the statement that both the father and the son were eternal but the sun was not assay. So assay is kind of the shortening form of the word aseity. And aseity seems to mean self-sufficiency, self-existence. And so the idea that the sun did, did not exist of himself, from himself, or by himself, but that the sun derives his existence from the nature and the essence and the being and the substance of the Father. Those are all words used for the Greek term usia. So the debate really is about whether the Son and the Father was homo usias, which means the same substance or of the same substance, or the Son was uh, heterousias, which means the son was of unlike substance to the father or a different substance to the father. So Arius uh, uh, thought that the son was heterousias because of the biblical text that says that the father has life in himself and has given the son to have life in himself. So it appears that the son's ability to give life is a derivative and contingent upon the father's gift to the son to give life to others. So in that context, both father and son would equally be eternal, but nonetheless, the son would be begotten of the father in a sense that lacks co-equality or co-existence. What I mean by that is the son was not co-existent with the father in terms of their his origination. The father doesn't have an origination because he is our say, he's self-existent. But for Arius, the son has an, a beginning. He has an origin in the divinity or the substance of the father. So this was the basis of the discussion uh, and debate between Arius and of course Athanasius and then Alexander, the bishop from Alexandria. And uh, this formulated a backdrop to, of course, the debate at the Council of Nicaea. Of course, it must be noted that Constantine the first, his interest was not first and foremost in my reading, uh, religious. His, in his, his interest was first and foremost political because, of course, his realm was divided into east and west. I think you had Galerius, you have Licinius, and there was just uh, 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 various divisions in the empire. And so as an emperor, he wanted to secure some sense of unity within his realm. So uh, through the secretary, uh, Hoseas of Cordova, or Cordoba, uh, the Spanish uh, 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 secretary, 
uh, they thought that they would bring this issue to uh, Constantine uh, as it also was creating division within the empire. Of course, religious divisions alongside the political divisions that Constantine the first already faced. Um, on top of that, most of the times we think that Nicaea was focused on the Aryan controversy, but it was not. There were about five or six other prominent issues on the agenda at Nicaea, including the, the Melithian schism with Melitas. Uh, then there was the issue between whether the father and the son were one in substance or one in person. Then there was the issue of baptism for those who were heretic or those who fell into heresy should they be rebaptized and so there were there were a host of things that Nicaea was concerned with 325 CE on top of the Nicene uh, uh, issues of course you had Arian Arius and his own controversy. Of course, there were many people who were initially on Arius' side, many of whom have deflected to the side of Athanasius, who borrowed, by the way, with the Nicene party, the homoousius uh, statement, which was somewhat brought into the, 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 the fray or the discussion, not by Athanasius and not by the Nicene party, but actually through the Monarchians. And the Monarchians, they borrowed the homoousius from Serenthius, who was, of course, very much steeped and have an interest in Greek philosophy. So Serenthius brought in the idea of, of homoousias, uh, the, the Nicene party and Athanasius. They did not like it initially, but they adopted it uh, from the, they initially used the term homoousias, which is of similar substance, but not the same substance. But when Arius thought about the heterousias, which is of different substance, then the Nicene Nicene party and Athanasius and Eusebius of Caesarea and the others, they actually borrowed the homoousias from the Monarchians, uh, whom was also one of their enemies, at least theological enemies to some uh, degree, and use that against Arius. So you can see the vacillation, the backing and forth, forth in between the Nicene party and their use of homoousias, homoousias, as an adversus against the Arians. And so for those who think actually that Arianism was actually ruled the heresy and it was settled at um, Nicaea, it's a misreading actually of the uh, of history. Uh, following 325 CE, even though Arian, Arius was uh, excommunicated and banished and he lost his see, that word see there means his episcopal see where he had some authority. Of course, Arianism did not die. It flourished elsewhere in various other parts of the world. And as a result of that, we have things like uh, semi-Arianism. And uh, after that, we have neo-Arianism, which is a new form of Arianism. So Arius did believe in the divinity of Jesus. He did believe in the eternality of Jesus. He just did not believe that Jesus was our say, that he was self-existent and that he derived his substance from the portion of the whole, as many of the other church fathers thought, such as Irenaeus and Ignatius and others who felt that the son's godness or deity was a derivative of the father's deity. So there is not a kind of self-sufficient deity stemming from self-existence, at least in the eyes of the Arians. And what Arianism became, we must be careful because Arius might not have intended what we now call and understand to be Arianism. So we must be careful how we read history and how we read them with particular lens. We must be mindful of our theological lens through which we read and so that we do not make actual assumptions or assertions based on a denominational or a theological presupposition. So we must be mindful of that. On the, on the other hand, we have what you call 
of course, Unitarianism. And Unitarianism is a wide term. There are various types of Unitarians. So there are Unitarian Universalists. Then there are what we call Unitarians that are used in a generic sense that believe in a one person, one self God, if you please. And then there are Biblical Unitarians who stem from that. And Biblical Unitarians is kind of an outgrowth of what we would call uh, Socinianism, but a kind of Socinianism reworked to a particular degree. So you have popular Unitarians today, Sir Anthony Buzzard, uh, Dr. Dale Tuggy and a whole host of others, some on the theological side and others on the analytic philosophical side or philosophical theological side. And so Unitarianism simply believe in what we would call pre-Nicaea in a kind of adoptionistic theology or dynamic monarchianism, if you please, that Jesus somewhat was adopted as the Son of God at his baptism. Some even push that uh, further to his resurrection and so on and so forth. So when you think about um, Unitarianism, you're thinking about Jesus being God's Messiah, Jesus being God's anointed. Yes, he's virgin born. Yes, he the word divinity or God may be used of him and so on. But they do not believe that Jesus is God in the same sense that the Father is God. The divinity of the Father is unique. So uh, Unitarians tend to view the idea of the monarchy as supreme in their view. So monarchical uh, 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 Unitarianism, if I can use that term, or dynamic monarchianism or adoptionist monarchianism is what Unitarians generally believe that there is one God and even though Jesus for some Unitarians may be called God generally speaking he is seen as God God's Messiah the one whom God anoints the one whom God uses and it is he is the Messiah and so it's from that perspective that Unitarians come they do not differentiate between of course the Holy Spirit and the Father uh, so they see God as spirit and they see the Holy Spirit as as God working in and through the lives of believers, through the life of the ecclesia, the church, and so on and so forth. So that is just a brief in-car conversation between some of the challenges between Arianism and biblical Unitarianism. Of course, these are more involved views of the nature of God and divinity, but at least that gives you a start to what the problems were or are when we think about Unitarianism. So biblical Unitarianism and also Arianism would reject the doctrine of the triune nature of God. Uh, they reject the idea of this tri-personality of God, that there are three distinct divine ontological and metaphysical being within the being of God. And they see the only God as the Father in Arianism, the Son is God, but only by virtue of the Father communicating a kind of divinity to the Son. So the Son's divinity is always subordinate. So Arius was a subordinationist, as are and were many of the pre nicene apologists and theologians. So hope that helps. I'm in the car. And if this is kind of obstructing you, my staring, please excuse me. But I hope you were very blessed by this very short uh, presentation. We will go more in details at some other time. Thank you very much. Appreciate you.